Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. We sit down with local elected leaders from all provinces and territories here in Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Municipality of Meaford, Ontario Councillor Brandon Forder. But before we get into that episode, I just want to take a moment and ask you to do a favor for us, if you can. If you want to join our growing list of subscribers and backers, please head over to the Cross Border Interviews website at www.crossborderinterviews.ca and hit the support the show page now. For as little as $3 a month, you can make an impact to make sure that this show continues to grow and to bring you more great content like the one you're about to see today. Now, on to our episode with Councillor Forder. Brandon, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with a generic question, but it's the question that sort of encapsulates what this whole show is about. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Brandon? Well, hey, good afternoon, Chris. And uh, thank you very much for having me on the podcast. Big fan and uh, really appreciate it. Um, I guess it's hard to say. Uh, my, I don't have anybody in my family that has been involved in politics other than just sharing opinions and things of that nature. But um, I do come from a family, a long line of entrepreneurs, and we do very much believe in community involvement and philanthropy and just community activism. And we, I should mention, I've only lived in Meaford for uh, six years. I moved here in 2017. I was originally from Oakville. And uh, when we moved to Meaford, we saw that, uh, and I say we as the family, uh, we saw an opportunity to make a difference in a small town that is really on the cusp of some really amazing things. And so just like a lot of people who end up getting in municipal politics, they might start off with, say, their local chamber of commerce. And so I was on the board of directors for the Meaford Chamber of Commerce for a number of years. Um, and even before that, I was the education director for the local business networking international group, the BNI group. And so as you start, you know, um, getting more involved in the community, you see no, new opportunities. And it just so happened that... Uh, we were making a change um, as a family and a business model. And uh, it just so happened to be around the time when the new term of council, uh, the campaigns were going to start. And so I had a nice chat with my family about it and we figured let's um, let's do it and uh, let's make a go of it. Now I should preface that saying, I don't have any previous experience in municipal politics. So I was going into this pretty cold, but um, it's the, uh, the capacity to learn on the job and to learn new skills and to do good things for the community. And those are some of my, my skill set. So it's been a really interesting journey to get to this point so far. I never really had, um, say, aspirations of municipal politics. That's just sort of the course life takes. But I'm very happy to be here. And um, we have a really nice, diverse mix of council in Meaford. So I want to give them a shout out and give them some credit. We have some very experienced councillors who have been on council for many years. And then myself and another uh, councillor are, are new to this, uh, the, our first term. So we have a little bit of mix, a little bit of diversity in age, a little bit of diversity in gender. So I feel like we've got a, um, a really good mix of everything. I feel really at home and they provide me a ton of mentorship as the, uh, the rookie on the block, I guess you could say. So while this is being aired in November, we're recording this the day after your one year anniversary of being elected to council in the municipality of Meaford. I want to go back to that election night, if possible. You, you yourself described green candidate. You kind of didn't really know. It's a lot of on the job uh, learning, as you've openly said. Um, looking back on it, is it what you expected so far? If you would have put yourself back in that those shoes in 2022 <laughs> and say, am I getting am, am I prepared for what I'm getting into? <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you for that. <laughs> I would say the scope of uh, being a municipal councillor is much broader than I was expecting. And that's not a bad <laughs> thing. I'm, I'm happy with the roles and responsibilities that come with uh, this position. But at the, the very beginning and you're very new, you don't really understand how much there is to learn um, and how much training is involved. And um, I'm all for that. But when you're when you're brand new, it's um, uh, you don't really know exactly what to expect. And uh, I had some mentors in the community that were sort of giving me some expectations, saying that, you know, new counselors might take you 18 months or two years to feel really comfortable in the role. And now a year in, I'm starting to feel really settled with um, 
how things work, the order of events, and all the things that happen behind the scenes that most people don't really get a lot of exposure to. Uh, so it's been a very interesting year, I'd have to say. But now that we're uh, we're feeling a little bit more comfortable in the role with a little bit of experience, it's uh, it's wonderful. We've been able to do some really amazing things for this um, budding community that is on the verge of some pretty incredible things. So going back to that election, prior to you putting your name forward, I've ran in two municipal elections in my time, one in a community that I had known for about the same amount of time that you did before putting your name forward, five, six years, and then one that I knew my entire life, Clarington, Ontario. So I'm originally from Ontario. Um, and I, I, I know when I was at the door in the community that I'd only been there for five years, there was always the undertone of you're new to the community. You don't know the issues of your community. Did you hear that in Meaford or did people look at you because you had done what you had done with the BN, BIN, with the Chamber of Commerce and say, Brandon's part of the community. I feel like you'd be a good voice at the council table. What were you hearing at the doorstep when it came to that aspect of the job? Because I think there's a lot of people right now across Canada who are thinking about putting their name forward who are in the same position you were in saying, I've only been here for five years. Do I have what it takes or will people accept me for a local? <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good question. And I think this is um, true uh, in smaller communities more than anything else. And, uh, you know, if you're not born in this community, you're not considered a local, uh, not in this community per se, but these are things that you hear is um, the opinion that if you're not born here, it doesn't matter how long you've lived here, you're not truly a local. Uh, but I find Meaford is very accepting. And um, uh, I do have, uh, we have a family business here in town. We have, a, um, uh, we're in the pet industry, so we offer some, some different pet uh, services. Um, and, and Meaford is extremely pet friendly. So the nice thing is over the course of the years, as I was getting settled into the community, we got to know uh, the majority of the people in the community because almost everybody has pets. So we were very involved in a lot of different things. So, you know, over the, um, over the first few years when you move in, you, as a business person, you really uh, work hard in the community to sort of raise your social profile a little bit and get more involved and get people to know you. And likewise, you can get to know other people as well. But I think I had the advantage where uh, my father was living in Meaford for 10 years prior to me moving up here with my family. So we were able to come up here on holidays and special events for the better part of a decade. So I already knew the town very well. I sort of had an idea you know, reading the local newspapers and I had an idea of what was happening in the town. You sort of just keep your finger on the pulse as, as much as you can. Uh, but as soon as we moved here and you really thought this is a very special place and um, this is a place that encourages you to get involved. It's very welcoming. We've got a lot of great community groups. So I think what really matters is that if you are new to a town and you really want people to accept you, you need to be an active participant in the community. People need to see you um, uh, active and doing things. Um, and that way you can build relationships because politics, much like anything else, it's all based on relationships. So that was sort of the angle that I had taken where we could develop relationships um, through people in the community. And one nice way of bridging that gap is um, with animals and sort of an analogy that I always use is, you know, Chris, you could really love cars and I could love cars as well. So you and I could be friends because of our mutual bond, our like for cars. However, if you have a dog and I have a dog, we will love our dog so much more than cars. So that, that, that bond on that is, is a much deeper level. So that was a, that's a really nice way that we could build some meaningful relationships in the community as customers become friends. And, uh, and that's sort of the, the ripple effect from there. But I think for, for those that are, first time uh, are considering to run for council for the first time, maybe in the next term, and you might be new to a, a community and you want to get accept, uh, accepted, my advice is get involved in the community groups, make yourself known, uh, be, an be an active participant, because the ripple effect from your actions can result in a lot of good things in the community. And I think that's um, um, ever more real in, in small towns. You... <laughs> You, you mentioned something in that statement I want to pick up on because you, you kind of had a pulse on the community. You kind of knew what the issues were. You you read the newspaper, you talk with your clients, you talk with your the people in your community, the Chamber of Commerce. But when you door knock, though, when you go out and actually ask people for their unfiltered opinion, you are going to hear a gambit of issues. Before I get into the issues themselves, I want to ask, were the issues that you were hearing at the door when you were door knocking when you were talking to people one-on-one -on -one about actual issues were you shocked at any of the issues that were coming up or did you have a good sense of what you were going to hear and you went okay 
I, 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 I feel where I can be a champion for if elected at city council. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Again, uh, I, I feel like I had a pretty good handle on what the pressing community issues were uh, prior to um, uh, putting my hat in the ring. Uh, I, I did all the work behind the scenes and made sure that I was educated enough on the issues. So when I have uh, conversations with customers, I actually knew what I was talking about, which is kind of an important thing if you're looking to be um, a municipal politician. So I don't think there was anything that was um, too surprising, um, I guess. Uh, we have uh, during the uh, the last election, say this time last year, uh, there were you know a few core um, elephants in the room that were big issues in the community. So those were the ones that really took the lion's share of uh, of the attention. Um, I guess during the, um, the the all candidates meetings, um, they're not really debates; they're all candidates meetings. So um, I feel like I had a pretty good handle on it. But every now and then, you get somebody who throws a little bit of a curveball at you. So were they more macro issues? So were they more town-wide issues that you were hearing at the doorsteps or were they more micro issues? Were they more the individual issues that uh, can sometimes come with municipal politics because provincial politics, uh, federal politics is always macro issues, but municipally you hear those uh, micro issues. So for you, what were they micro or macro? Yeah, that's great. We, um, we were at, at the point of uh, the municipality was entertaining a, a very large infrastructure project um, from, uh, from a multi-billion dollar um, energy producer. And that was a large issue that had a ripple effect because on a, on a micro scale, it's in, you know, it would be affecting the municipality of Meaford, but on a macro level, it, um, it, it would be something that would be um, affecting sort of the Ontario um, power grid. So that was um, that was one of the really big topics of discussion because that was very new and a lot of people didn't really understand what was happening. So there was a lot of unease. And then it trickles all the way down to, um, I don't wanna say smaller issues, but I guess in terms of a more micro level, um, looking at things like garbage collection and um, property standards managements and obviously water, uh, um, water rates and things of that nature that are, um, uh, more, um, they have more immediate impacts uh, with the, for the pockets of uh, ratepayers, whereas they're not necessarily, um, if a new infrastructure project goes up into the municipality, it doesn't necessarily mean that the taxpayer is going to have to pay for that. But um, smaller uh, infrastructure projects that are responsibil the responsibility of the municipality, those are usually the ones that get a lot more local attention because those ones affect the budget. And um, obviously, no council wants to raise taxes more than they absolutely have to. And so that was, um, I think that was most when I was door knocking, the questions were mostly in relationship, uh, relation to um, local development, uh, the municipal infrastructure, because we do have quite a bit of aging infrastructure. So looking at the, um, the short term picture and the long term picture going forward, municipalities, um, and we have a plan for this, but there's going to be some significant expenses to bring these things um, up to date. And I would say the majority of the people that I was speaking to were more concerned about those more localized issues. You you have been in the job for just over a year now by the time this airs. Well, one year and one day is over a year, in my opinion. <laughs> and you've probably had to make some tough choices around that council table. You are the government that impacts people the day after you make those decisions. Now, I know once you get elected, you kind of get thrown into the deep end with a budget that you have to pass with have to sort of get gear up for and make sure that the operating and capital budget for 2020, the next following year is passed. Uh, I know you're going into that situation right now. I'm assuming you're going into that situation, I should say. And there's probably day to day issues that you have to deal with on a regular basis. How do you do the job to make sure you're helping the majority of people at that local level? Because you impact people the day after, and some of those impacts may mean that they have to pay a little bit more at the uh, park or uh, at the service for service levels or even taxes. So for you, how do you balance the job to make sure you're doing it in a way that is not impacting the day-to-day -day lives of people in a negative way? Isn't that the million dollar question for all? I mean, it's the million dollar question, question comes later, Brandon. Come <laughs> on. This is just like fun time questions. <laughs> no kidding. Well, I think um, I really, as an entrepreneur, I really approach uh, my municipal responsibilities um, as a business person. So um, 
I represent the corporation of the municipality of Meaford, and it is it is an incorporated entity. So I want to treat it like that. And I have some businesses myself, and I um, I run my capital and operating budgets, and we do everything our own version of what the municipality already does. So I already had a lot of experience with those sort of formulas, and we were just carrying it over from the private sector to the public sector. However, um, I find that uh, it's about um, again, it, this is a relationship-based industry. So um, it, you wanna make sure that you are entertaining all opinions um, because sometimes the loudest voices are not necessarily a reflection of what the opinion is of the entire municipality. And mm -hmm. as a corporation, you wanna make sure that you're um, um, in the spirit of good governance, you wanna make sure that you're making decisions that are in the best interest of the municipality as a whole. So I guess in a nutshell, the goal is to make decisions to upset the fewest number of people. <laughs> is it easy? Is it easy though? Because uh, I'm going to use your analogy here. You're right. The corporation of uh, the municipality of Meaford is a corporation and your business is a corporation as well. Now, not everyone uses the corporation, your, your business, and everyone uses the town services, whether that be taxes, whether that be the roadways, whether that be garbage, wastewater, you name it. You, though are impacting every single person in your community with every decision. Mm -hmm. You're right. You you want to talk to everyone. You have to do it in a respectful manner though as well because you have to listen to the people who are the loudest voices, but you also have to go out and search because I know from working in a municipality, the quiet voices are the ones who usually don't engage. There's an apathy with that that issue with them even saying, you know what, as long as my water uh, turns on when I need to brush my teeth or go to the washroom and my garbage is picked up, I'm a happy camper. So how do you ensure that the decisions you make, you get the full gambit of views and make sure that you hear those loud voices, but also the people who may not traditionally come out and say, you know what, counselor, I want to give you my opinion today. Mm hmm. And I think a lot of that comes down to being an active participant in the municipality because most of the um, most of the correspondence I have with residents actually are not in my office. They're um, at the parks or they're at the grocery store or they're at all the community spaces. And through just living in the community, these are opportunities for me to talk to people that may not necessarily want to make a, a, a deputation at a council meeting to uh, oppose or be in favor for a project per se. So being an active, approachable person, uh, I think is really important because that encourages the people. You can't force people to talk to you that don't want to talk to you, of course, but if you can make yourself as approachable and as available as possible, then I think, so I guess we will look at it as um, uh, your best feature is availability. So if you can make yourself av available to the people, um, and I, as a younger counselor, I really embrace a lot of new media. So whether um, a resident wants to meet in person for a coffee, that's wonderful, but some people just want to text and I'm totally fine with that. So whatever it takes to talk to the person, but I think making yourself available is where it all starts. So you bring up a good point because you are a counselor no matter where you go in your community. And I, I, I would assume, unless you're a large city or an urban center, you don't get paid as urban center politicians do. <laughs> you are a uh, part-time counselor, but with full-time hours. And I say that because you go to the grocery store, you're a counselor. You go to the park, you're a counselor. So over the last year, I can imagine there's days that you have just wanted to be Brandon, where you just want to go out, grab some <laughs> milk, come home and relax. But you know, even as a business owner beforehand, you can't do that because people will stop you. Have you found that balance yet to say, okay, I need to just be Brandon sometimes, and then I need to be counselor Porter as well? Mm -hmm. And I think I have a pretty good handle on that. The um, I get a lot of um, sense of duty and sense of purpose out of this role. So it's something that I'm very passionate about. So I very rarely want to just be myself and not have the counselor hat on, um, except if I'm at home playing with my kids or something like that. Nothing else matters. That's, that's my <laughs> world right there. Um, other than that, it's these things are really important to me. And, uh, you know, you don't necessarily need to be on the clock 24 hours a day but I'm always available. And it's the same thing with my private business. Many of my clients have my personal phone number and they'll just call me throughout the day, even if it's before or after business hours. And you just try to make yourself available. Nothing's ever perfect. Nobody's ever always on the clock, but um, I feel that there's a pretty good balance. But the nice thing that we do, we do sort of everything as a family. So um, 
you know, when I'm, uh, my wife and I talk about municipal issues nonstop, that's, you know, we're very, both very passionate about this. And so it's, um, anytime we have a chance to talk to a resident, it's an opportunity for us to learn more about the municipality and deepen that understanding. So um, I've never really had an issue with um, feeling um, uh, like the hours I'm putting in as a counselor, um, you know, maybe the juice isn't worth the squeeze, for instance, um, uh, completely the opposite. I, I get a lot of purpose out of this role and I'm, I'm more than happy to make myself available anytime to anybody that needs me. So you brought it up. So I'm going to, I have to ask the question. I, I don't know how old your children are. So I apologize that this question is off the left <laughs> field, but do your kids know what dad does? Do, you, do your kids, are your kids excited that dad's a counselor or are they at that age where they understand that dad's a counselor and oh God, if we go to the park, dad's going to have to talk about council stuff. So <laughs> maybe I get an extra 45 minutes at the playground while he's talking to somebody. Yeah. And this is a cool question. I really appreciate this one uh, because my, my father was a great mentor and role, still is, but uh, as a child, he was my mentor and role model and he instilled a lot of great core values in me. And I'm trying to do the same thing with my children. So I want to lead by example and demonstrate to them that, you know, again, if you're an active participant and you're doing meaningful things, really good things can happen in the community. And I'd like them to not just hear my words, but to see me doing it and leading through action. And so they think it's really cool that their dad is friends with the mayor, for instance, you know, um, but, uh, you know, so my I have um, three children, uh, two girls that are 11 and seven, and then I have a two-year-old boy. So our household's pretty busy, but my seven and 11-year-olds, they think it's really cool that I get to go out and I get to do things uh, to help the community, uh, and we get to help people within the community as well. And we also get to make plans for shaping this community in the future. And I plan on being here for my whole life if uh, nothing gets in my way to change that. That um, and I'd like to. I'd like my kids to know that as they grew up, that their father was um, uh, responsible for playing a role in some of the amazing things that have happened or, or will happen in Meaford between then and now. So I want to turn to segment two because I am cautious of time here. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it, as I always do, that this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion. Counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the municipality of Meaford today? Mm-hmm. Like every municipality, housing is number one. Uh, that is not unique to Meaford. That's every place. So we certainly um, have our issues. And as a small community with, uh, you know, a smaller housing base that uh, has that ripple effect that affects everything. So we, um, as a council, we actually had been working with the county, with Gray County, on an affordable housing project on a piece of property that was owned by the Blue Water District School School Board still is owned by them, and unfortunately, school board didn't like our proposal. So that um, we're still trying to find other ways to make something work, but our initial plan doesn't seem to be favorable. So we are trying to do some things that are in, innovative in, in the community, and um, there are just so many moving parts that nobody really has a solution for. Um, you know, the housing crisis, particularly affordable housing but we do have considerable number of housing developments that are taking place in Meaford or will be taking place. So that will certainly help, but that doesn't help people right now. So are Other developers knocking on your door? Are developers actually knocking on your door right now to say, we want to build in Meaford? Meaford's a great place that we, we can see building a new subdivision or building three, four new subdivisions in your uh, municipality? Absolutely. Uh, we are on the We've always been saying that Meaford is on the cusp of a development boom, but we are starting that right now. That boom has happened. And so we have a great number of developments that are either starting right now or will be starting in the near future. And that also, because we're located between Owen Sound and Collingwood, as those municipalities continue to expand, Meaford is quite desirable being right in the middle. Um, but we're pretty unique in the sense that from a geographic perspective, Meaford is the same size as the city of Toronto, but we only have 11,000 residents. So we, um, we are quite a large piece of land. Um, and that also brings in some other issues. For instance, we have a pretty disproportionately high amount of roads and bridges. And roads and bridges are very expensive to build, maintain, and repair. 
So we um, that is a, quite a challenge when uh, with every budget season, trying to figure out how we can uh, maintain all of this infrastructure. But we do something that's a little bit unique and uh, Meaford spends uh, more than any other municipality in the county on roads and bridges. And we have a, um, a 1% um, capital levy that we apply for roads and 1% for bridges every single year. Uh, because without that, we would not even be able to make a dent in, in that amount of infrastructure. And a sort of a, Chris, as I touched on earlier, um, some of our infrastructure is, is quite old. And our wastewater treatment facility is certainly one of those. Right now, it currently operates between 70 and 80% capacity, but it doesn't have the required capacity sort of to accommodate some of the newer developments that are on the horizon. So we have a wastewater treatment master plan that we've been working on, and even previous term of council uh, was working on it as well. A pretty big project. So we're hoping to have that um, started in 2025. And hopefully completion sometime in 2027. And of course, um, short-term accommodations are a big um, hot topic, particularly in tourist communities. And Meaford very much is a very uh, tourist-friendly community. So um, uh, we as a council right now are right in the middle of um, our STA project charter, uh, where we are gathering data, uh, getting information. Right now, actually, yesterday, we just completed part of our in-person public input uh, sessions. And we also have some online uh, uh, forms and surveys that residents can fill out. So we're in the information gathering part of that, but we have about 150 or so uh, short-term accommodations in Meaford. And um, we're very fortunate that we have very few um, negatives to say about um, these STAs. Um, so that that is a very positive thing we just want to make sure that we're able to create a bylaw framework that helps support this industry but also helps um, has measures and control to help mitigate any negatives should they arise um, so that is um, you know i would say those were sort of three or four of the issues that affects meford um, and of course the list goes on <laughs> no but i want to pick up on the infrastructure part for a second because a i don't think when i started this show in February of 2023 to talk about municipalities, I would ever be talking about wastewater and wastewater treatment plants more than I have in the last year with municipal leaders from across Canada. And I say large, small urban centers, rural communities, it is, seems to be the hot topic for every community. But I want to talk about infrastructure as a whole here for a second. And I got to ask, you can't do the improvements, the upgrades, the the Age, the uh, replacements of aging infrastructure on the backs of your residents today. You need the federal and the provincial government and all levels of government to come to the table with some sort of new framework for municipalities to help municipalities get through this aging infrastructure. But they're not coming to the table right now. So I've got to ask the sort of million dollar question. This, one of the many million dollar questions is, how do you do this in a sustainable way where you're not doing it on the backs of residents and they're not saying you're letting our town become a wasteland because you're not improving our infrastructure, but you are, it's just not at the pace that people can see on a regular basis. Yeah, that is quite the challenge, of course. And um, we, it takes a lot, it takes a lot of creativity and innovation. And I have would you, say, have, have, I know you're only a year in, but I've got to ask, have you had to put off a project or look at, a look at just reducing the way that a project is done because of the way that the affordability crisis inflation has sort of challenged every municipality when it comes to uh, service levels for construction workers, uh, services and actual uh, uh, like, uh, goods and services is what I'm trying to say. Have you had to put off projects or is that even something that you're th like the current council's thinking about? Mm -hmm. I don't think we've had to, we've got a really good plan in place. So first okay. of all, you know, we, um, we as a municipality and we have amazing staff that, you know, do a lot of uh, really important things for, to help council. We have been, um, I think, very effective at measuring, uh, evaluating all of our assets and determining, um, I guess, by order of triage, what sort of needs the, the greatest attention first. But I feel that um, a lot of the credit goes to the budget process. Now, I haven't been involved in more than one budget, um, municipal budget process as a councillor, but this past budget season uh, in our first year, 
I was um, extremely blown away with the, um, the level of support and the innovative thinking when it comes to making sure that we can strike a, a balanced budget that helps give us the funds that we need to work on the things that are pressing without, I don't want to say without raising taxes, but with minimizing the increase. We, um, we did a pretty good job where our last budget season, when we received our first um, draft budget, the proposed uh, tax increase was around 8% and we were able to get that down below four. So we were really happy with that, but we really didn't have to do much slashing in terms of investing in our, uh, our infrastructure. We've got some really great asset management plans that um, have everything laid out. So we have great timelines. We know what we're working on. We know more or less what things are gonna cost. We can't forecast how expensive things are gonna be in the future. Um, but nobody can, so that's not uh, a problem unique to Meaford. But uh, I think a lot of it, and now be, me being new, I don't have a lot of experience in this role, but I take a lot of comfort in knowing that we have the right people around the table that do have the experience. And my goodness, we, we put in the work. Last budget season was a really amazing exercise to go through. And now on the back end of that, looking back on it, I'm really proud of our efforts. And I think we um, did right with the ratepayers to make sure that we're providing all the levels of service that more or less they want and need um, and still being mindful of uh, their pocketbooks at the same time. Now, I, I ask this question all the time. I'm going to change it up because I know you've only been in the position for one year. While you're going into your second budget cycle, you are going to have to make some tough choices of the needs and wants of your community. Now, you've talked about certain aspects that you see as issues in your, in Meaford, aging infrastructure. But if you go talk to 100 people in your community, they're all going to give you something else. They're all going to tell you that there's micro issues, potholes, park upgrades, this, that, or the other that need to be fixed. You know, after a year in office, that municipalities don't have unlimited supplies of money. They have a very small amount of money that they have to deal with. And you have to balance your budgets every year. How do you see yourself going into this budget cycle or even during this budget cycle saying, okay, the needs and wants are great, but the realities is what needs to take precedent in the world that we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. And that's a great question. I think um, just keeping your expectations in line. I mean, the budget season never really ends. As counselors, you always <laughs> have the budget in the back of your mind. So whenever you make a decision, you always think, what kind of an impact are my decisions going to have on the budget? So I don't think there's anything that's going to be coming up in the budget that's really going to be a shock or a surprise or something that's going to be a major struggle for us to balance that we're not already expecting to be there. So we're already starting to have these conversations about um, um, how we're going to approach these issues, how we're going to be able to fund them. And again, back to my previous answer, how we're going to be able to strike that balance. Because of course, if we could fix everything yesterday and we had the funds to do it, that'd be a great scenario to be in. But uh, we have to make sure that we're being fair. Now, an and to touch on that, an interesting thing about Meaford is we do have our urban center, and then we also have a vast rural center. So when it comes to budget and allocating funds, we really want to make sure that we strike a balance supporting both sectors of the pet uh, of the pet industry. Can you tell? <laughs> I'm always thinking of something um, in the municipality. So. Uh, we never want anybody in the rural community to think that their tax dollars are only going to support the, um, the urban areas and then vice versa. So having a little bit of a balance and even to get back to a couple questions before uh, when you're asking about um, community issues, door knocking and things of that nature. One of the common questions that would come up is how are you going to bridge the divide between urban and rural? And so uh, that that was a very interesting thing when we look at all the funding that may need to go into, say, a rural bridge that's going to be fairly expensive to build because bridges are never cheap. But maybe that bridge is not used by thousands of people like some of um, our, infra our road infrastructure in the more downtown core. But those bridges are very important for supporting agriculture and um, supporting that really big part of Meaford's industry. So uh, we actually, and as a matter of fact, we recently just opened up two bridges that have been closed due to lack of funding for close to a decade now. And that is a, um, that's a rural bridge that is um, pretty integral for supporting a number of um, agricultural businesses in rural Meaford. So we are pretty proud of that. But I'd say going into these, this year's budget, I'm not expecting anything to... Um, 
come up unexpectedly that is really going to be a huge surprise. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to have challenges trying to make everything work when it's all said and done. So I'm going to play a little devil's advocate here for a second. I want to pick up on a question that you were asked during the campaign that you just openly said, and I wasn't going to bring it up, but here we are now that you did. You said, how are you going to bridge that urban rural divide? And you've been in office for one year. How are you doing on that issue? How, if you, if that same person who asked you that during the 2022 municipal campaign asked you that today, what would your answer be? Being available and being present. You never want to only be available during the during the urban centers and in, uh, um, you know, urban events and things of that nature. Obviously, that's the hub of the community in terms of activity. But we have plenty of things that go on in the rural communities as well. And the ratepayers don't necessarily just want to see a counselor sitting at the horseshoe and making decisions. They want to see that these people are investing in different parts of their community um, and being out there. So a lot of my door knocking through last year's campaign was um, primarily in the rural area of Meaford, the um, the urban areas, I was already pretty comfortable because most of those people were customers of mine and I already had great relationships with a lot of those people and then my involvement with the chamber, those things are all very um, urban area centric more or less in terms of the, uh, uh, um, the events and activities that go on. But in order to comfort um, people in the rural sector that might feel that urban is getting um, all of uh, the lion's share of the attention, being able to be out there, being present. Uh, and we actually did have a number of all candidates meetings in um, some of the rural centers that we have around Meaford. So I feel that as a municipality, our staff do a really good of job of making sure that there's a balance um, uh, through the campaign process. So council, all the council, council candidates can make themselves available to people in all different areas of town. And just because geographically how big we are, the urban center is not always accessible for somebody who lives on the outskirts of town bordering some of our neighboring municipalities. Um, so again, it's being present in the, uh, in the community, being an active participant and just making yourself available. And I think that shows, I think that counts for a lot as a rate payer when you see somebody that is trying to be a municipal leader and they're actually leading through their actions and making themselves available. Um, I think that's a really good start. I don't know if there's an easy answer to bridging the urban and rural divide, but again, availability is such an important thing because you need to be able to make uh, create relationships with people, and whether that's in the urban or the rural centers, it still applies. So you got to put in the work. I, I've been accused on this show of only talking about the negatives when it comes to municipalities, particularly in this segment. So I've got to change it up a little bit here, and I've got to ask. Give us some silver linings. Give us the good of what's going on in Meaford today. What are the accomplishments that you say, you know what, this is what Meaford's all about? Oh, you, and this is a great question. I'm so <laughs> glad. All your questions are great, Chris. This is a really good one. So thank you. Um, Meaford is at a really unique time where we have all of the all of these new changes happening. We have a lot of new developments. Um, COVID sort of accelerated a lot of things because um, as everything was sort of shut down, a lot of residents from the GTA were relocating into um, uh, more tourist friendly communities. And it's interesting, Meaford and the GTA has a very close connection. And um, so we did see an influx in um, a lot of new residents that may have only had vacation homes, but now this is their permanent home because they're more comfortable being up here. So the nice thing about that influx is now we have a, a lot of new motivated people that are getting involved in the Meaford community groups. And so whether that is the Rotary Club of Meaford, which they do so many amazing, we, they actually had um, an after five event last night at the, um, what they call the Rotary House, which is a, um, a thrift shop that sells clothing and other items um, at very affordable prices for people of all ages. And this is in an old church that they took over. And then in the bottom level hosts the Meaford Food Bank, where they service hundreds of people that um, have food instability issues. Uh, but it's the, uh, the number of volunteers that were able to take this concept of having a rotary house and actually making it come to fruition. So last night was a really cool um, celebration and recognizing and showing appreciation for the people that do this. Uh, but we also have a lot of other great community groups like the Meaford Culture Foundation, and these are all nonprofit. These are all community-led or resident-led community groups 
And uh, the Culture Foundation does a lot of really great things to bring arts and culture into this community. And they work very closely with Neiford Hall, which is one of our um, one of our main attractions in terms of uh, events and arts and culture. And I mean, the list goes on uh, when it comes to that, but I think the, um, uh, the increase in public participation makes all the difference because these groups being volunteer led, these groups are only as effective as the people that are involved with them. And so that sort of ties into another thing that Meaford's done that's sort of innovative is that we, um, council recently voted to dissolve the Meaford uh, BIA and for a number of reasons, uh, but we had a plan to implement a new um, community-led organization called Meaford Main Streets. And this one I'm very excited about. And it, it's not live yet. We're still figuring this out. But the, um, the, the Meaford Main Streets is a citizen-led nonprofit that is um, intended to support the downtown revitalization. And this Meaford Main Streets model has been around since the 1980s and it's been implemented in thousands of communities across North America. And it's all about collaboration and supporting each other. And through all of these community, community led initiatives, it drives um, economic development. It revitalizes downtown cores that may um, have been going through some tough times, especially with the pandemic. So I'm very excited to see this project get off the ground and that'll apply from everything from events and uh, arts and culture, events, um, uh, mentorship and education and support for businesses. This is gonna be a pretty cool program. Um, Sounds very like it. Innovative. <laughs> I'm the county that's doing something like this. So very proud of uh, what this could possibly be. Um, I'm looking forward to learning more about this later on. So once it actually is up and running, let's chat again. But I am cautious of time then because I just realized we're at the 40 minute mark and I asked you for 45 minutes. So hopefully you got an extra five minutes for me if you're okay with that. Um, okay. Before, so I want to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart and that is tourism. And I know you've talked about it in your issues, but I want to expand on a little bit more because I truly believe that municipalities play a role in our tourism sector. And I truly believe that municipalities don't, promote themselves on a national stage because they just don't have the money so i'm giving a little bit of my time and my energy to promote municipalities so and as as i've said on the show many times if you come on the show i'm coming to me for it i've got a massive swing of southwestern ontario that i have to go through next year and i me for it is one of those stops so as a tourist as someone who is listening to this, this and says maybe i should go visit me for it what are the tourist hotspots? What are the hidden gems of your community that you say, if you come to Meaford, no matter what, you have to stop at X, Y, and Z? Oh, my goodness. Where <laughs> to start? Um, the first place to start, though, is our natural features. You know, the great thing about Meaford is it's not... Um, it's not what we build that's going to make Meaford um, a desirable tourist attraction. It's the natural features we already have. And we sit right on South Georgian Bay, one of the most pristine freshwater bodies on the planet. Uh, we have some of the nice view, nicest views you can possibly imagine, some of the cleanest water. If you're looking for natural beauty, Meaford is a one in a million location. It is absolutely phenomenal. And as a municipality, we really uh, try to embrace that. So there is a, a lot that an active outdoor type person can do in Meaford without having to spend any money or visit any shops. We have a um, great waterfront. Uh, now, another really cool thing I should mention is we have one of the few off-leash dog beaches in all of Ontario, uh, which is a really cool feature, particularly for pet-friendly communities. But we have a, a ton of really great hiking trails, um, like the Tom Thompson Trail. And we've got the Georgian Trail, which is an old rail line that's about 34 kilometers in length that goes from Meaford to Collingwood. And that is a very well-traveled um, trail. So our natural features are abundant. And so if you love the outdoors, Meaford is definitely the place for you. I would say though, if we're looking for one particular thing, Meaford Hall is definitely a gem. The, um, the attractions that come to Meaford Hall um, uh, recently I saw Tom Cochran there and he tore the roof down. It was amazing. Wow. But there is, yeah, it's, uh, so we get some, some, some good performers there. And, um, but Meaford Hall is a really amazing place. It is, um, it was constructed in 1909 and it actually used to be, um, it used to have a jail cell in it as well. So it used to be where they would 
st store some bad guys for a while. So there's a lot of really interesting history with regards to Meaford Hall. Um, but that is a that is a really good hub for art, arts and culture and entertainment. And then Meaford Hall works um, in close proximity with some of our community groups that specialize in um, uh, in arts and culture. Um, and then also throughout the year, we have a number of events that are like, for instance, coming up, we have Christmas on the Bay, which we just um, had our first year last Christmas, uh, which went very, very well. And we had thousands of people coming from all over Ontario and beyond. And we essentially, uh, we, um, the Christmas on the Bay crew, they pretty much transformed Market Square into a winter wonderland with all sorts of entertainment and activities and bonfires. Like it was incredible. And then that ripple effect where all the businesses um, adopted the same theme. So now you can go window shopping and everything's very Christmassy. It looks like it's out of a Christmas movie. It's absolutely incredible. And so we're building on that and it'll be bigger and better this year. Uh, we also have Summerfest in the summer, which is a big gathering with all sorts of great uh, activities and events. And we also have the Meaford Pet Expo, uh, which this year brought in about 2,000 people. And again, celebrating um, the municipality's love for pets. We have a lot of really amazing things that happen in this community all the time. And credit to, the, to these events goes to the volunteers that are ones that are organizing and volunteering and dedicating their time and energy into making things happen. Because without these volunteers, these things don't happen. And they didn't happen prior to these um, great thought leaders in the municipality getting involved and again, being an active participant in the community. And then these are the results of their efforts. So I'm very, very proud of these sort of grassroots led um, um, events uh, throughout, throughout Meaford. So you can come up here any time of year and there's always something amazing going on. So for a small town, we are busy and bustling and uh, we got a lot of arts and culture that we like to show off. So where do you go though? Because I can imagine, because it seems like you have many hats in Meaford. You have your business hat, you have your dad hat, you have your husband hat, you have your counselor hat, and you have just a, a Meaford hat on. Where do you go to just decompress after a long day of work, after a long day of council meetings? Because I can imagine some of them are quite long, um, especially budget <laughs> times. Where do you go to just let it all go? Because you know the day after you're going to have to get back at it and represent your community, represent your business, and be the best person you can be to make sure Meaford gets everything it wants to accomplish done. Mm -hmm. There's no better place to clear your head than going to the water. There's, I'm fortunate to live in an area where I'm in walking distance to the beach. And if I'm having a, a day and I just need to clear my head, you go down to the water and nothing else matters at that point. It's, um, it, it's, it's quite, quite an amazing place to recharge. Either that or I'll go for a hike with my dog on some of our long trails and you can get lost in the woods for hours and you're almost transported to another world where there's no development, there's no cars, there's no, it's just nature. And you're embraced, uh, you feel like you're just a part of something that is, um, feels very natural and organic and it's very um, calming. So I'd say those are the two places where I do find, um, the, I get, the, I get the, the best stress relief, if you will. And the nice thing about these is you go hiking with your dog, you're getting a little bit of exercise, good bonding with your best friend. Um, and then you're surrounded by nature with birds chirping and everything else going on. I mean, that's, and then you're done your walk and you clear your head, you get in the right state of mind and it's back to business. Thank God. Thank you for not saying your house. How many times have I heard, I go to my house to relax. So thank you so much for that. So I'm going to now ask the true million dollar question. And I think this is a question that every municipal leader needs to be able to answer. I think they have an answer, but I think it needs to be said on a re repeat. So I'm going to ask this and you take as long as you want to answer this as you want, Councillor. In your opinion, what makes the municipality of Meaford such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Mm -hmm. These are all the reasons why I left my previous town and decided to make my forever home here in Meaford. It has so many of the features that are desirable. I really wanted to raise my children in a, a small town that still has a lot of that small town charm and small town feel, but also has the potential to grow into something um, not greater, but something um, as everything needs to evolve. Um, 
there's um, some really amazing things happening here. So I feel that this is the right balance for me and my family and what makes this place very attractive is you have a really nice balance between having some space. Uh, we have a lot of space here because we're a pretty big municipality. Um, we have we're, uh, we have an abundance of natural features that just, I mean, words can't even do it justice. Chris, come up and I'll take you to all the great places and uh, you'll never want to leave, I promise. And I just want to make a note, the reason we came up to Meaford, and this just shows you how desirable Meaford is. My father, um, and I guess this would be 16 years ago, my father came, went up from Oakville to Meaford to visit some friends who um, had recently bought a house here, and he had never been to Meaford before. He went there for one weekend. He called me on that Sunday, and he bought a house in Meaford. Didn't give it a second thought. Bought it on a whim, and I remember getting a call on the Sunday morning, and he said, I just want to let you know I bought a house in Meaford. And I didn't know where Meaford was. I knew where Collingwood was. I was a big skier at the time. So I, to me, I thought, oh, this is great. Now I've got a place to stay when I go skiing. And um, I never really understood at the beginning why my father would make such an impulsive decision because he's not that guy. He's very calculative. Um, then I started to spend more time here. And I was like, yeah, I get it. it. This place makes you feel at home. It's a very welcoming community. It's a very supportive community. And we have a lot of amazing things that happen here from our natural features to our arts and culture, to our entertainment, to our shops and our restaurants. We have the best balance of everything without being an overdeveloped urban center and still retaining that small town charm that I think many, many people find uh, very desirable, especially after COVID. So I think what me makes me very special is we have a really nice balance of all of the things that somebody would um, desire if you had to make a wish list for a small town that embodies all of the great things that a small town really should be. Well, you've sold me on it. I can tell you that much. So if I can get my <laughs> husband to come with me with the dogs, because A, pet friendly beach is always a plus in my books. I don't care where you are. And B, I now know someone who's in the pet industry in Meaford. So I'm able to get potentially some discounts, if you know what I mean. I'm joking. Maybe I'm not. <laughs> who knows? Um, but I will certainly look you up when I'm coming through Meaford later on next year in 2024, because I'm hoping, knock on wood, to be attending the AMO conference. So we'll be doing a big tour of Southwestern Ontario, because we're going to RV it across Canada again. Um, but before I let you go, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for doing this, A, and thank you so much for serving your community. Uh, municipal leaders don't hear that enough, and I think you guys should. I truly believe you guys are making the best out of what you have, and it shows. Your Every municipality in this uh, country has great leaders like yourself at the table, and we couldn't have asked for better people in this last election to be elected to serve and make these tough decisions. So thank you so much. Chris, thank you. Your words are very appreciated, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be on the uh, Cross Border Podcast with you. I really appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun, and um, good luck with everything, my friend. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support either. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of this community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues what truly matter to you and to our communities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.